Hello and welcome. This is Begun God TV. My name is Elisel Rodriguez and we are going to be looking at the God key today. The God key. Um, what I mean by the God key is the usage of the word God. The biblical usage of the word God is something that we have lost as Christians. And what I'm going to attempt to do today is to teach you the right way to view the word God. The mistake of the doctrine of the Trinity is attributed in large part for the lack of understanding the word God and its usage and its ability to be used in different ways. And because of that, when early um, councils and Christians who read the Bible now or read um, the early church father's writings misunderstand the usage of the word God and how it can be used as applied to Jesus. What I want you to understand is that the word God applied to Jesus may be a misunderstanding in your mind. I'm going to show you with biblical proof. I'm only going to use the Bible to teach you how the Bible uses the word God. The word God can only be used the way the Bible uses it. So if the Bible uses it in certain ways, it can be used in those exact certain ways again. And that is something that we need to understand. So what we're going to do is look at the term God. God in Hebrew is Elohim. The word God in Greek is Theos. The word God in English obviously is God. Now what we want to look at is um, that what I want you to understand is that the word God is a title. It is a word that represents a position. It represents a, an authority. And it also can be used in different ways to mean different things. Predominantly, the word God is used as the highest being to be feared. That is the highest being who has the most authority and who deserves all respect and fear and reverence. That is generally, predominantly, the way the word God is used in the Bible. Let us get that straight. That is predominantly the way the word God is used. But what I want you to see is that the Bible also uses God as a title and in different ways. So here's what we're going to look at. I'm going to read a couple of verses and then I'm going to read through all of them. I'm going to give them to you. So get your Bible out, get your what you know, your applications, your whatever whatever um, things you use to read the Bible with, pull it out. Let's look at this real fast. Um, number one verse I want to pose to you. And we're looking at the word God here. So this is what I want you to focus on, is the usage of the word God. And then after we read through all of them, we're going to break each one of them down. The first verse I want you guys to look at is Genesis chapter 2, verse 4. I'm going to be using the King James Version. Essentially, through all of my book is going to be from the King James Version. Not all the time, but predominantly it's King James Version because most people like King James Version. Although I have problems with King James Version, um, I will use it. Okay, <clears throat> so Genesis 2, 4, it says, These are the generations of the heavens and of the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. That's Genesis 2, 4. Next verse is Exodus 15, verse 11. Now remember, we're looking at the usage of the word God here. 11 says, Who is like unto thee, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like thee, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders? Okay, let's look at the third verse. Psalms 82.6, it says, I have said, 
ye are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High. Very interesting usage of the word God there. Number four, and the Lord said unto Moses, I'm sorry, let me tell you the verse. Um, the fourth verse is Exodus 7 verse 1. It says, and the Lord said unto Moses, see, I have made thee a God to Pharaoh, and Aaron thy brother shall be thy prophet. Amazing. Number five verse that we're going to look at. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4 says, In whom the God of this world hath blighted the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. That is another usage. The first one, right? There's two usages of the word God in that verse. And both of them mean different things. The number six verse I'd like you guys to look at is Philippians 3.19, which says, Whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is their shame, whose mind, who mind earthly things. That's Philippians 3.19. Okay. So, as we can see, there are several usages of the word God in the Bible from the verses that we have looked at. Now we're going to look at these verses a little closer now, each one of them, so that we can understand if we misunderstand how the word can be used in the Bible. So, Genesis 2.4 um, Number one was Genesis 2-4, where the title of God was preceded by God's name, or the letters in God's name, which is Y-H-W-H. When it says Lord in the King James Version with that capitalized lettering, it means that it says Jehovah there, or Yeshua, I'm sorry, Yehoshua, I'm sorry, or Yahweh. So it says Yahweh or Jehovah in that spot. So it says... Um, God's name there, right? Or the letters that are in God's name. So there's no confusion on which God we're speaking of. It is Jehovah God. Not just any God, not just some random God. It is the Lord God, Jehovah God, Yahweh God, right? And these are just the letters that are in his name. They're, the letters do not actually are not actually his name. But they're just the letters that are in his name. But its representation is of the real actual name of God. So we're, there is no confusion of what God we're talking about. Yahweh God. Okay. So number two. Number two uses the, the word Yahweh in it. In verse um, 11 of Exodus 15, 11, it says, Who is like unto thee, O Lord? So that's, and then the way it's spelled there is with the capitals. So it means that it is actually saying Jehovah there or Yahweh there. So it says, <coughs> excuse me, who is like unto thee, O Yahweh, among the gods? Now, this usage of the word gods, and it's in lowercase, it's in lowercase because the writer or the, the translators want you to understand that it's not meaning that there are a lot of gods out there and that that you know that God is the only one who is like him among the other gods like we're supposed to be polytheistic like in some way or another um, the word um, gods there is in reference to false gods now we know that sometimes even as Christians, when we say um, false idols or those false gods or those, you know, talking about other religions and their gods, you know, we talk about them, we use false gods. We use the word God. Uh, we can we could reference them as saying, oh, their gods are, you know, so-and-so and so-and-so and, -so and whatever. You can say that um, and not be blaspheming God because God is not technically a title. 
So in English, we kind of understand that God does not mean God's name and that it can't be used for someone else. We know that we could describe false gods with the name because the name is, or the word, because the word is not actually the name of God. It would be wrong for us to say that the other Yahwehs of other faiths, that's not right because we're actually using God's name or what's represent, representing his name and saying that um, that they can be applied to other gods um, for the, to describe them. That's not right. That's not correct. That's not the way to use it. And it's insulting to God. So you cannot use that like that. But you can use the word God with no problem because it's just a title, a position. So I want you to remember that it is a title. It is a position. It can be applied to false gods because it is explaining what um, level someone else thinks they are on right um, <clears throat> uh, I think we understand that even though we use the same word God for false ones it is not necessarily taken as though they were real gods but acknowledging that someone else considers them as such <clears throat> so in that respect we understand that it's not blasphemy if we call false gods gods as long as you know we're not worshiping them or anything like that so that is one way that god can be used the word god can be used to describe the position that someone else places for another false god right a false god not that our god is false but that their god is false among the many so number three verse um, so that's out of the way. We know that you can use the word God to describe false gods and not and not be blaspheming God because it's just a title. Uh, Psalms 82.6 in the King James Version or in whatever version you're using. Now this verse applies to humans when it uses the word God in this verse. This is the part where Christians have lost the understanding. Okay. How many sermons have you heard where they called us gods or called themselves? But, um, but that is the way the Bible is using it. If we look at this again and read it again, it says in verse 6, it says, I have said ye are gods, and all of you are the children of the Most High. Now, let's examine this for a second the Bible the Holy Spirit has allowed the Bible to write the following words I have said ye are gods and all of you are the children of the Most High we don't have a problem with the second part as far as we're children of the Most High but we have a problem with someone calling us gods right but the bible says that it calls us gods in what sense of the word right in what sense of the word are we gods we could be um whatever sense it means right being children of god being children of god being the son of god being sons of god and daughters of god we can be called gods in some sense, but it feels wrong. It does. And if we're humble and wanting to serve God, we may not necessarily want to accept that word because it's holy and reverential to the Father. Um, so I get that. I understand. I don't necessarily want to call myself God. I don't necessarily want to call my brother and my sisters gods but the Bible uses it for humans in this verse. And I bring that up because, sorry, I need to fix this. I bring that up because what we need to understand is that it can be used for humans. It can be used for men and women. Um, in this place, that is the way it's being used. Anyone who tells you different than that is not telling you the truth. Um, 
um, let me go here. Um, today, Christians easily accept the fact that they are children of God. We understand that we were sinners, but by the grace of God, we have been forgiven through Jesus and are now children of God. It does not seem like a radical idea, but in the time of the New Testament, it was a very radical thing. In fact, if we were standing before the Jews of the time of the New Testament, they would have considered that blasphemy. Let's examine a verse that shows how the Jewish people considered being a child of God blasphemy in their eyes. So let's look at this again. Let's read verse, um, verse, um, sorry, Psalms 82.6 again. It says, I have said, ye are gods. Okay, the Bible is talking to humans. And all of you are the children of the Most High. So the children of the Most High, if you call yourself a child of God, you are calling yourself essentially a God because you're saying, I am a child of a God. I mean, literally, listen to what you're saying. I am a child of God, meaning that you are also from God. To be a child of God means a lot of things, if you think about it. But people in the old in the old, in the New Testament, when when Jesus was saying, I am the Son of God, what they heard was him calling himself God. And he said, No, I'm saying I'm the Son of God. And you, they're saying, No, you're saying you're God. You're saying you're a God. So um, let's look at it. Um in verse uh, in John chapter 5 verse 18 it says in verse 18 it says therefore the Jews sought more to kill him because he not only had broken the sabbath but said that God was his father making himself equal with God so they in the old in the new testament believed that because Jesus was saying that God was his father that that was calling himself God, right? Making himself equal with God. That's what they believed in the New Testament when the Jews were confronting Jesus and Jesus was saying, God is my father. And he's, they're saying, okay, so you're saying you're equal with God, that you're the same as God. And that's not exactly what Jesus was saying, but they were taking it to an extreme when he said that. Um, and today, we as Christians we say that God is our Father. We say that God is our Father, that we are children of God, that now we are the children of God, that we are sons and daughters of God. That's what we believe. We are, if the Jews were standing before us, they would want to kill us because we're saying that we're equal with God. They would think that we were saying that we were equal with God because we say that God has forgiven us, and get made us his children. The Jews of that day would want to kill us because we say that we are sons and daughters of God. Do you understand what I'm saying? Let me say it one more time. The Jews of the time of Jesus would want to kill you because you say that Jesus, I'm sorry, that the Father that God the Father is your Father, that He, that you are spiritual sons and daughters of God. To say that, the Jews would consider that blasphemy because you're making yourself equal with God. Now, do you mean that? Let me ask you, Christians. Do you mean when you say, I am a son or a daughter of God, that you're saying you're equal with God? Is that what you're saying? I don't think so. I think that you understand that you were a sinner once and you're forgiven by God, that you have a beginning. You're not eternal like God the Father, but that he is your father nonetheless, and that you're not trying to elevate yourself up to his status, but you are elevating yourself up to a status higher than where you are now. That now you are a son of God or a daughter of God. And that it does raise you up to a higher level as a human, as a person. 
but it's not that you're trying to exalt yourself up to the point of being God Almighty or the Father. So just understand that in the in the uh, time of Jesus, the Jews would consider what we call, you know, the adoption that God has adopted us and has made us his sons and daughters by Christ Jesus. That statement alone, we are trying to make ourselves equal with God. They would believe that. That's the way they would look at it. They wouldn't say, oh, you're trying to say that you're a child of God because of forgiveness and he's adopted you and now you're part of the family. No, they're going to say, you think you're equal with God. You think you're on the same par with God. You're, you're saying that you and God are equal and that's not possible. And that's the problem the Jews had when Jesus was saying, I am, my, the God is my father. God is my father. He's not saying he's equal with the Father, okay? He's not saying that. That's a Trinitarian idea. That's a Jewish idea to say, if you think your God, your Father is God, then you're saying you're equal with God, so now you're equal with God. The Jews rejected it and would want to kill you, and Trinitarians would say, oh, okay, so you and God the Father are one and the same. I'm just telling you like it is. All right, so verse Psalms 82.6 uses the word God and applies it to human beings, okay? So what I want you to understand is that the word God can be used for human beings, okay? Does that mean that you are equal with God? No. Do you believe that you're equal with God? I certainly hope not. I don't. The point is, is that we lost this truth. The Bible says and uses the word God for humans. Okay? And that's a truth. You cannot deny this verse. Psalms 82.6 says that you can use the word God for humans. <coughs> do we want to use that word? Not really. Do we want to apply that word to ourselves? We should probably be humble and not use it because it's a fine line and I wouldn't want to use it for myself. You know what I'm saying? But we cannot ignore the fact that God can be used for a human. Okay. And not be blasphemy. And not be against God. And not be something that God would dislike. But that the Bible itself calls these in that verse gods and it calls them children of God. So it's not like they were calling them gods because they thought they were gods, but really they were not. And God was fixing to judge them or kill them. No, they are the children of God. So the children of God can be called God in some sense of the word. Not as the absolute sense, not in the highest sense, but in some other lower sense of the word. Because he is our father and we are children of God. Something we have to understand, something that we have to get through our minds that we don't understand. The word God can be used for humans. It can be. The Bible has shown us that. So let's move on. I don't want to get too um, crazy with that. I just want to make sure you guys know. <clears throat> um, so <clears throat> let me read here. Uh, what's more important here is that the mere concept of a man or woman claiming to be a child of God was equal in their eyes of considering oneself God himself. Talk about putting words in your mouth. I would like to interject here that in the same way the Pharisees were deducing claiming to be God when one claims to be a child of God, this is the same way Trinitarians assume Jesus is God Almighty from twisting statements. Although the verse we read in Psalms 82.6 shows that we can consider ourselves children of God without calling ourselves 
equal with Yahweh. What's interesting is that the Jews went to such an extreme to confuse what was being said that they forgot the verses that agree with that statement. They made statements that were contrary to their own understanding about the Bible because they did not find fault in anything Jesus said. As Christians, we understand that we say we are children of God. We are not saying that we are necessarily equal with God, but that we are his children through grace and forgiveness. But the Jews of that day would not accept that argument from us and would consider us blasphemers, heretics, and false prophets. In the very same way that they treated Jesus, also in the verse, the man of God who wrote this called us gods. But in what sense of the word? Certainly not in the sense of being God himself, but in some other sense. To help us understand what could possibly be meant here, let us examine another verse using the same context. Verse 28, Exodus 22, verse 28, we're going to look at. This is another usage of the word God as it is applied to men, to humans. It says, Exodus 22, 28, it says, Thou shalt not revile the gods, nor curse the ruler of thy people. Now listen to that again. Exodus 22, 28 says, Thou shalt not revile the gods, nor curse the rulers of thy people, or the ruler of thy people. What is it saying? Is the Bible telling us not to talk bad about other gods? Thou shalt not revile the gods. What does that mean? We get the hint of what that means in the second half of the statement. The second half of the statement says, Nor curse the ruler of thy people. So it says, Thou shalt not revile the gods, nor curse the ruler of thy people. In this verse, in verse 28, when it says gods there, it's talking about the leadership, the judges, the magistrates, the people in authority in the government or the theocracy that was back then, the judges. Thou shalt not revile the judges, the magistrates, the leaders, the city council people, the whatever, that were there back then. God is saying, respect authority. Okay? Respect authority. God has appointed authority over you. Respect that authority. Now, but it calls them gods because they have, um, <clears throat> like the Supreme Court, they have a higher level of authority than regular people do. Police officers, presidents, congressmen, all of these people. If we had this in our time, when they said, thou shalt not revile the gods, would mean the congressmen, the city council members, the police officers, the, the Senate, the president, all that stuff. We should not supposed to revile them. Not that they're God or equal with God or on the same par with God or capable of doing the same things God can do or able to kill or any of these things. No. All it means is that it is just a description of them having a higher authority than regular human beings. Okay? That is the sense of the word. I'm going to read to you Matthew Henry's um, commentary because you're, you're, you may not believe what I'm saying, which is okay. But I'm going to read you Matthew Henry's commentary, and you can look it up for yourself. Other commentaries of what they say and who they're talking about. But they're talking about not false gods. I think God would probably want you to revile false gods. He's talking about the authority that God has set up. <clears throat> It says, and law against the concept of authority, verse 28, thou shalt not revile the gods, that is the judges and magistrates, for they're executing these laws, they must do their duty. Whoever suffer by it, magistrates ought not to fear the reproach of men, nor their revilings, but to despise them as long as they keep a good conscience. But those that do revile them for being a terror to evil works and 
workers reflect upon God himself. So all it's saying is that it's talking about judges and magistrates and people of authority in the theocracy, because it was a theocracy. It wasn't a government. It was um, a theocracy. So <clears throat> that shows that Matthew Henry, at least, and most other commentaries will tell you that when it says, thou shalt not revile the gods, it's talking about human beings. So that's a second instance where the word God can be used for human beings and not mean at the same level, at the same height, at the same position as God, but only as a title, as a title to show that this person is supreme over others. Okay? Okay. Now, I'm going to skip all of that. <clears throat> now, um, okay, so right at this moment, I'm going to show you that we must have balance when we understand the scriptures. Balance. Not to, you know, unbalance the world and the understanding. We need to have a balance. Yes, God can be used for, must be used for God, obviously. God means highest authority. When it's used for God, it means the highest, most possible authority. Okay, when it's used for man, it's used as a higher than other men, but not at the height of God. Okay, it must be a balance. Okay, because we read the scriptures that say God is used for the word God, is used for God. So God can be used for God. It means highest to be feared. Okay, God can also be used for um, false gods, describing that they are false and that they are also considered gods, but we know that they're not. So we need to have a balance there and understanding. Now, we need to also understand that the word God can be used for humans and, and not go all kilter and say, okay, we're all gods and not say, okay, well, to understand that when you use the word God for the Father, it means the highest. When you use the word God for humans, it means uh, higher than the rest of the humans but not up to the level of God. When you use the word God for false gods, it means for false, not true, not real, probably not alive gods, but that someone else somewhere on planet Earth considers them as such. Not that it's true, but we recognize that someone else believes that. That's it. So <clears throat> here's an explanation. We're going to go to Adam and Eve, and you guys know the story of Adam and Eve, and I'm not going to... Um, read the story of Adam and Eve, but I'm going to explain it to you, um, and uh, hopefully you guys know the story. But um, <clears throat> when Adam was told not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, Eve was not there. And the Bible doesn't talk about when Adam talked to Eve about not eating from the tree of the, of the knowledge of good and evil. But what we do understand is that when the snake talked to Eve, Eve said, Thou shalt not eat of it, nor shall you touch it, or lest you touch it, um, because you shall surely die, right? And then Satan's like, you shall not surely die. You know, it's like straight up lie, bold faced lie. But the problem here, in my opinion, is that Eve did not understand correctly, okay? When you have a rule, like the only sin that you could do in the Garden of Eden was to eat from that tree, that's the only sin that you could have possibly done because that's the only rule that was made for Adam and Eve. Everything else is permissible. Walking around stark naked, not a problem. You know, doing whatever, not working, being lazy, eating fruit, doing whatever, none of that, that's not a problem. The only rule you have is to not eat from that tree. So Adam at some point had to have explained to Eve that, you know, when I got here, Eve, the God said, the only thing we can't eat is that tree. Okay, so don't touch it or eat it. Um, he may have said it that way. He doesn't say, okay. <clears throat> but what she said was, and we know what she said, we know what she thought because she said it. She said, you, you should not eat of it and you cannot touch it. Okay. Um, we can read. What we're finding here is that she believes that she cannot touch it. Now, God did not say that you cannot touch the tree. She believed that you can't touch it or eat it. 
Now, this is all a hypothetical, but it may be possible that Adam told Eve, look, Eve, that's a bad tree over there, Eve. Don't touch it. Don't eat it. Don't touch it. Stay away from it. Okay? All right. Now, when you add to God's law, right, when God says something, if you add to it, you cause problems. So if you say um, you can't eat of it and don't touch it or you'll die, right, that's a lie because God didn't say if you touch it, you'll die. God didn't say you couldn't cut the tree down. God didn't say you couldn't burn the tree. God didn't say that you that you couldn't um, climb up the tree and look down the the, the valley. Um, God didn't say any of that stuff. You could have you could have cut the tree down. You could have touched it. You could have um, torn it down. You could have burned it. You could have done anything with it, as long as you did not eat it. That was the point. Don't eat it. When you apply laws and rules on top of God's laws, you cause the possibility of error. And this is what I'm talking about with balance. What would happen if Eve was strolling along, you know, going to go pick berries or whatever, go find a, a you know, following a baby bear somewhere is running around trying to, you know, check out this baby bear or something. What if she was walking down and was walking underneath the um, tree of knowledge of good and evil? Now, let's say that that fruit or a leaf or anything, a branch, broke off and flew down and smacked her on the head. Let's say the fruit fell off and smacked her on the head. Now, at this point, Eve believes because someone told her or because she believes it on her own, that she cannot touch the tree. That's not true. But if she got hit by a leaf or a branch or a tree or a fruit from that tree, walking under it, inadvertently touched it, if that would have happened and she believed incorrectly that she cannot touch the tree, then if it hit her, she could say, oh, well, I'm not dead. I'm not dead. I didn't die. The fruit hit me from the tree and I didn't die. So that may that will make her question, well, will I even die at all? Now that I've touched the tree and I'm not supposed to, and if I touch it, I die and nothing has happened, why can't I just eat it now? Maybe the whole rule and lies, maybe Adam's just lying to me and I really can't eat the tree. Maybe he's just hiding it from me. Or maybe God just doesn't want me to have this great thing. I mean, so many things could go on. But because she did not understand correctly, she believes that she can't touch it. That's not actually God's law. God's law was don't eat it, not don't touch it. So and I'm not saying that this is what happened in the garden. But what I'm saying is it gives you a good example of what happens when you do not properly understand what God said. Take what God said for face value. Take what God said as what he said and do not add to it for fear of something happening. And it seems correct for us in our minds to say, you can't touch that tree. I know God said, don't eat it, but I don't even want you to touch it or you'll die. That is going to cause problems when you add to it. So when we say you cannot use the word God for humans, that is unbalanced. That is adding to the word of God. That is adding to the Bible something that it's not saying. If you say you cannot use the word God for humans, it's not allowed. It's blasphemous. It's a sin. That's not true. You're afraid that you're committing a sin or you're putting rules out there that are not existent because the Holy Spirit has allowed the Bible to write down, to document 
two uses so far that I've shown you, two uses of the word God for humans. Okay? Two uses of the word God for people who are individuals or beings who are not God. Twice I have shown you a verse that says you can use the word God for beings other than God and it not be a sin. This is the truth. You're going to have to deal with that in your mind and just see why you're not, what sin is there. If we understand where God is and we understand what we mean when we say God to humans, what sin is there? Okay, that's what I want you to get at. That's what I want you to understand. It must be balanced. Do not add to the rule. Don't say, do not eat it and don't touch it because I'm afraid you're going to make a mistake and eat it. Because adding to the laws of God, adding to the word of God is wrong and is a place of stumbling. Okay, it causes a place of stumbling. It gives you opportunity. When you add to words God's word, it is like lying when you add or take away from what God says when you add or take away from the Bible from what it says clearly you're causing stumbling you're causing error you're causing mistakes you're causing people to misunderstand you're perverting the word it is a truth you can use the word God for humans or you can use the word God for other beings other than God and not mean God. Okay? All right, we're going to move on. I'm sorry, it's taken a while. Um, okay, <clears throat> let's move on. Um, okay, so um, we must under, we must also take, uh, we must not also take away from the command as it is clearly stated, because it harbors confusion. Um, Deuteronomy 4.2 says, You shall not add unto the, ver to the word which I command you. Okay, now let's look at this verse real quick. Deuteronomy 4 verse 2 says, Ye shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall ye diminish from it, aught from it, that ye may keep the commandments of the Lord which I command you. This is a command from God. Ye shall not add unto the word which I command you. Like Eve said, you shall not eat of it or touch it lest you die. That's not what God said. You're adding to the word of God. All it said was, all God said was, do not eat of it. Not do not touch it. That's adding to. So the word here says, Deuteronomy 4.2 says, Ye shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall ye diminish aught from it. In other words, don't take away. Don't say, um, you know, don't touch it, and um, but it's okay to eat from it. Or, or I forgot to tell you the uh, don't eat it part. Because you're going to cause a stumble. You're going to cause people to make a mistake. So understand the word clearly, the Bible clearly. In its uses of the word God, God can be used for God Almighty. And it's an exclusive usage when you use it for God. The highest being to be feared, the Father. It can be used for false gods to explain their falseness and what stature people put on them. It can be used for humans or people who are not God in a lower sense of the word, in a lower sub-sense of the word, always under God. Okay, but in a correct sense, but under sense. Um, this truth is only true when it is in its purest form. So the Bible is only true when it is in its purest form. Let me say that one more time. The Bible is only truth when it is in its purest form. Adding to or removing from the truth makes it untrue and the breeding ground for confusion. This is part of the reason why the Jews that confronted Jesus misunderstood his actions because man-made laws were added to God's original laws. Now I'm going to show you another instance when someone added to the word 
when they shouldn't have added or taken away from the word. People say, and what I'm trying to get at here is to show you that people have taken away that it is possible to use the word God for beings other than God and not mean that they're equal with God. That is what is, has been taken away from us, is that understanding that the usage of the word God can be used for someone, and it does not have to necessarily mean the highest God to be feared, but it means you're higher than the rest. So we're going to see the Pharisees did not understand Jesus because they were more interested in their man-made laws and their man-made rules instead of Jesus. Uh, Mark 7, 5 through 9 says, <clears throat> Then the Pharisees and scribes asked him, Why walk not thy disciples according to the tradition of the elders, but eat bread with unwashed hands? He answered and said unto them, Well, well hath Isaiah prophesied of you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. How be it in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines, the commandments of men for laying aside the commandment of God ye hold the tradition of men as the washing of pots and cups and many other such like things ye do and he said unto them full well ye reject the commandment of God that ye may keep your own tradition he's saying you love your tradition you love the man-made commandments you love all of that stuff but you don't care about God you don't care about the truth you don't care about what's real you don't care about what's really in the Bible. You just care about following everyone else. Tradition, which the Trinity is tradition, by the way. It's not in the Bible, obviously, as we have seen with the other videos concerning scholars and other that. It's not in the Bible, but it's tradition. We've all believed it, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Not going to go there anymore. Um, <clears throat> balance is the key, guys. Balance is the key. <laughs> um, so with that being said the Bible clearly shows that the title God can be used for judges magistrates and the servants of God without violating the commandments of God okay let me read that again uh, with that being said the Bible clearly shows that the title God can be used for judges magistrates and the servants of God without violating the commands of God without violating the commands being okay we can call judges magistrates and certain people gods and not be violating God's commandments okay it's clear in the Bible but let me show you one more uh, before we move on to the other verses one more interesting thing here I believe that it is safe to say that Jesus never misunderstands the Bible, right? Jesus never misunderstands the Bible. Jesus, if anyone knows the Bible, it's Jesus. Of all the teachers in the Bible, Jesus can be trusted most. And interestingly, Jesus has commented on the verse that I had told you about, the very first one in Psalms 98. I'm sorry, 89. Here it goes. <clears throat> John chapter 10, verses 34 through 36. I want you to understand that Jesus is, this is Jesus' understanding of the verses that use the word God for humans. God has given us a chance to understand what Jesus' opinion, Jesus' commentary, Jesus' opinion about what this verse means okay so you of all the things that i've said so far if you don't believe them at least you can believe what jesus says right if jesus says that it's okay that it is that is the way that it's interpreted that is the way that it's used will you believe that i'm what i'm saying that god can be used for humans or other beings other than god let's see John chapter 10, verse 34 through 36. Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law, I said ye are gods? Verse 35 says, If he calls them God, gods, 
unto whom the word of God came. And the scripture cannot be broken. Say ye of him whom the Father hath sanctified and sent into the world, Thou blasphemest, because I said I am the Son of God. I'm going to reread this. But before I reread this, I want you to understand. I'm going to explain it to you, what he's saying, and then we're going to reread it, and you're going to see that that's what he's saying. He's saying, <clears throat> is it not written in the Bible that um, that that the prophet in Psalms 90, uh, 89 says, ye are, I call you gods, that I said ye are gods? So he's saying, you remember that verse where it says, I said ye are gods? Do you remember that verse? And then he says, if he who got the word of God, if the guy who got the word of God from God and who's writing these words down, if the guy who received the words of God called these guys gods, And the Bible cannot be broken. And it's talking about unrighteous judges, by the way. Unrighteous sinners. Gods. He's saying, if the Bible calls unrighteous judges gods, and, and the scripture's not wrong, and the scripture's not incorrect in calling them gods, God has placed it there, the Holy Spirit has placed it there, why do you say of me, the guy who God has sent, the person who God has sent into the world to save them, that I'm blaspheming God because I said I am the son of God, which would, which would mean that I am God's son. And you're saying that because I say I'm God's son, you're saying I'm blaspheming even though the Bible calls unrighteous judges gods? Is that what you're telling me? That's what Jesus is saying in these verses. Now let's read it again and let's see if you see what I see. Jesus saying, verse 34 says, Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law, I said, ye are gods? If he called them gods unto whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken, say ye of him whom the Father hath sanctified and sent into the world, thou blasphemous, because I said I am the Son of God? Okay, guys, this is amazing. You need to circle this in your Bible. Jesus is saying, yes, he called, the Bible calls Humans, unrighteous human judges, gods, and it's not a sin. Why is it not okay to call Jesus the Son of God or anything else as long as it's in the same way? Okay. Not going to focus too much because I'm reaching an hour here and I'm sorry. Um, <clears throat> I'm sorry. Um, not trying to not trying to take your entire day. I just want you to know that this is truth, and it's not to be ignored here. Um, what Yeshua Jesus is saying is here is foundational to the understanding of one of the most important truths in the Bible. Jesus is reminding the Jews of the scripture that, that says, "Ye are gods," and then he says that the man of God who received the words of God called the other servants of God, gods. Now this statement by Jesus explains his interpretation of the verse. His interpretation is that the word God can be used for people who serve Jesus. I'm sorry, serve the Father. This truth spoken by the mouth of the Son of God cannot be denied because to do so is to claim that Jesus does not understand the scripture correctly. And I do not believe that it is possible when we read the word God and we see something that does not conform to our understanding, we must submit to the truth and not try to add to it something that it does not say. Another thing that Jesus says after acknowledging that even the word, uh, even the Bible applies the word God to the people of God, 
He also makes a statement that the scripture cannot be broken. In other words, it is not an error in the Bible. We cannot undo what the Bible already teaches. It is forever a testament against anyone who does not accept this truth. Because as Yeshua, Jesus says, it is unbreakable. So before someone tries to tell you that I'm saying what I'm saying is heresy, they may want to re-examine this verse. Um, <clears throat> all right, we're going faster here. Um, number four, Exodus 7, 1. And I'm going to try to rush here. I'm sorry, but I'm trying to make them short videos, and then I get all crazy, and it goes long. I'm sorry. And the Lord said unto Moses, See, I have made thee a God to Pharaoh, and Aaron thy brother shall be thy prophet. Listen to what God has said here. God is saying, Moses, I have made thee a God to Pharaoh. <clears throat> the Bible is saying that Jesus, I'm sorry, that the Father is appointing a human man, God, to another human being. Okay, listen to the verse again. And the Lord said unto Moses, See, I have made thee a God to Pharaoh. Now, are we saying that God has appointed another God? Are we saying that Moses has been elevated to the height of God himself? No, 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 no. That's not what it means. When it is used for anyone other than the Father, it is in a lower sense of the word. Okay? Whatever sense that is, it is definitely a lower subservient sense. Okay? Number four. The fourth verse. Exodus 7 verse 1. We're going to read it again. And the Lord said unto Moses, See, I have made thee a God to Pharaoh, and Aaron thy brother shall be thy prophet. Let's read it again. God can appoint a man to a position that is called God, and that person is still under God's authority. Okay? That is not unprecedented. So is it possible that Jesus is being called God because he is appointed to the same kind of office that Moses is in this verse? Is it possible that what they mean by God when they speak about Jesus could be in this same sense a position that Moses was appointed by God? Sorry. Mm -mm. I think it is, okay? And the Lord said unto Moses, See, I have made thee a God to Pharaoh. I'm going to read this real quick. In this verse we see a truth <clears throat> that I've never heard preached before. Now let us remember that the word, that when the word Lord is spelled in all capitals, it means the actual name of God is being used here. Yahweh says that he has made Moses a God. What does that mean? We have seen a verse where Yahweh appointed a man as God to the king of Egypt and Aaron, his own brother, a Jew, and the future priesthood of Yahweh. Before we go any further, let us remember that the scripture cannot be broken according to the words of Jesus. And I can say that these verses existed in the Septuagint. They existed back when Jesus was alive. So from this verse, we can safely say that God can and has appointed beings as a God to others on earth. That is not to say that Moses was free to do as he pleased. That is not to say that Moses was at the same equal with God. That does not mean that Moses was eternal. That does not mean that Moses was Co-equal with God, co-eternal, limitless, almighty, all-powerful. It doesn't mean any of that stuff. All it means is that God had appointed Moses high above all other humans on earth. 
when he says that he had appointed Moses as God, that means that he appointed Moses over any and all humans on earth, that there was no one higher in the universe according to these men on earth. Do you understand? God had appointed Moses to the highest position anyone on earth could have. And it was called, what was that position called that Moses was exalted to? God. Is he equal, co-equal, co-eternal, all-powerful like God? No. He was still under God. He still had to obey God. He still had to follow God's commands, follow God's rules, follow God's meanings, follow God's direction. And if he made a mistake, he was going to be disciplined. Because he's not God. He's not equal with God. He is only appointed to a position called God. So remember, the Bible is not confusion. You have to understand what the Bible says about God. Let us read this, uh, Numbers 20, 9 through 12. It says, And Moses took the rod from before the Lord as he commanded him. And Moses and Aaron gathered the congregation together before the rock, and he said unto them, Hear ye, uh, hear now ye rebels, must we fetch you water out of this rock? And Moses lifted up his hands, and with his rod he smote the rock twice, and the water came out abundantly. And the congregation drank, and their beasts also. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron. He says, Because ye believe me not to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore ye shall not bring this congregation into the land which I have given them. Moses, who was appointed to the position called God, by God, which position is lower than God Almighty, by the way, was chastised and corrected for not following directions when God told him to do a certain thing. He did not do it. He did something else out of frustration, out of anger, out of stupidity. God forgives him, but God disciplined him and did not let him go into the promised land. What you need to understand is even though this person was at the position called God, that God had elevated him to that point, to a position called God, in the human sense, in the sub-sense, in the lower sense of the word, Moses still had to obey everything God had commanded because he was still under his authority and he was not equal or up to the level of God. Is it possible that Jesus could be appointed to that same level, lower level. Who knows? Hebrews chapter 3, verse 1 through 6. Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Yeshua, uh, Christ Yeshua, or Jesus, Christ Jesus, who was faithful to him that appointed him, as also Moses was faithful in all his house. For this man, talking about Moses, for this man was counted worthy of more glory than Moses, insomuch that he had built the house that hath more honor than the house. For every house is built by some men, but he that built all things is God. And Moses verily was faithful in all his house, as a servant, for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken of after. But Christ, as the Son over his own house, whose house are we if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end? They're commingling the glories that are given to Moses, the glories given to Jesus. Moses said, God's going to raise up a prophet after me, who's going to be like me, who's going to be come." you know, after me and be like me. And Jesus comes. <clears throat> if Moses was elevated to the position of God in the human lower sense of the word, then how much more elevation can Jesus get if Jesus' glory is greater and higher and better than Moses's? <clears throat> Hebrews 
<clears throat> What's being shown here is that Jesus was counted worthy of more glory than Moses. Now I understand that Jesus is due more glory than Moses, but given that we know about Moses being appointed as a God in the servant of God since, how much more glory can Jesus receive? We will study that in another chapter. But what we must understand is the usage of the word God and how it can be used. And a little verse to kind of show you again. Psalms 45, 6 and 7 says, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter, no, let's start over. I'm sorry. Let's start over and see who it's talking to first. Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of thy kingdom is a right scepter. Thou lovest righteousness and hatest wickedness. Therefore, God, thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. This God, in verse 6, says, Thy throne, O God, is talking about a human king. It's talking about Jesus. It says, Thy throne, O God. It's a prophetic statement about Jesus' future. Thy throne, O God. In the lower sense of the word God. Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. Meaning, Jesus is going to live forever and ever, okay? He's on an eternal throne. Not that he's eternal. He has a beginning. But he's on an eternal throne. Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. The, the, the scepter of thy kingdom is a right scepter. Thou lovest righteousness and hatest wickedness. Therefore, God, thy God. That thy God is a higher God, a more higher, more excellent, more powerful, the highest being to be feared, God, the Father. Thy God hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. Amazing. Another usage, just look at that verse again. Psalms 45, 6, and 7 shows a usage of the word God again for a king of Israel, a man king of Israel. Okay? That is another, that is the fourth place that I have shown you where the word God is applied to someone other than the Father. And it was not sin. It was not wrong. It was not sacrilegious. 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, uh, the last verse that I'm going to look at, says, In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them that believe not. Talking about the God of this world would be Satan. So the word God has been used for God himself, the real, true, awesome, powerful God. It has been used for humans. It has been used for false gods. It has been used for kings. It has been used for Moses. It has been used for the devil. It uses the word God for the devil. It's just a title. And it depends on what you're applying it to to understand its meaning. For a man, it's in a lower sense. For God, the Father, it is the highest sense. For the devil, it is um, what power he thinks he has here. That's it. Not that he's a real God. Not that he's real anything. Not that he has any valid power. It's just a word that's used, a title that's used. Okay? That's it. Now... <clears throat> The last one, I'm trying to go through here. The last one is Philippians 3.19, which says, uh, Whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, whose mind, who mind earthly things. So it even calls the belly, stomach, your appetite, your God. Their God is their belly, their appetite, their desire, their whatever. 
He's calling that God in that verse. So the word, the, the word God can be a title of a position. It's a title. It has very many various reasons and ways to be used. Ultimately, God the Father, he's, it's normally used for God the Father, always. It has been used for Moses and kings and magistrates and everyone else some of the time. It has been used for um, uh, false gods. It has been used for stomach and used for the devil. But what I want you to understand is that the word God can be used in new and different ways. It can be used the way the Bible has used it before. So can the word God be used can be can the word God be applied to anyone other than God and it not be blasphemy? Yes, it can be used for other beings other than God and not be blasphemy, but also not elevating that person up to equality with God. Moses was not equal with God. The magistrates, the kings, the judges of Israel back then were not equal with God. They just had a higher position than others. Jesus, as we know, has a higher position than all others. Every knee shall bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. That means that if the word God is applied to Jesus, it is a lower sense of the word and not necessarily equality with the Father. Okay? That's my point. And that is the key, the God key. God key. What is the usage of the word God? How has it been used in the Bible? How can we use it? How can we understand it? What are the possibilities of understanding how people in the Bible use the word God for others? And can it mean, or does it always have to mean, the highest being to be feared? Or can it mean a lower sense? This is something that I've just proven to you, that the word God can be used for someone else other than God in a lower sense, and most, most likely, if God has appointed this person to that position, if God has appointed a person, a being, to this position, like he did with Moses, then that means that it is not wrong to call him that. But not in the fullest sense of the word. In some lower respect, whatever it has can be, as long as it's lower, it's not wrong. That's all I want to show you. The God key. I've just given you. Now you know how the word God can be and has been used in the Bible. And because you understand now, maybe you can understand how people made mistakes when they read verses that called Jesus God. And that's the key you need. Thank you. My name is Elisette Rodriguez. I am so sorry this takes so long. I'm very long-winded, I guess, but I want you guys to understand the truth. And if you don't understand the truth, what am I doing? I don't want to make things harder for you. I want you to understand it exactly like I understand it. And you have to understand this before we can go further. Study the Word God. Study those verses that we looked at and find out, are you missing something? And if you are, what is it? And um, please visit my website, BegottenGodT.com. Uh, and um, my book I put on the website for 99 cents. So you guys can have it. Um, I wanted to sell it for more <clears throat> and kind of make some money off of it because it took a long time to write. But frankly... Um, it's not selling. It's not selling because I don't know why, but I'm just going to give it away for 99 cents and maybe I can buy myself a coffee or something with it. But if you're interested, feel free to get the book.
go to my website uh, and it'll take you to the link. Um, it's on Kindle, I think, or Amazon, wherever that's at. But <clears throat> um, this is a long video, but I just want to tell you guys, the next few videos are probably going to be just as long. And I'm not trying to make them that long. I'm trying to get this book and read it to you in this in, in and it's not a big book but I'm trying to get it to you to give it to you the way I wrote wrote it and for you to guys to understand it and sometimes it just takes longer than I think I want to give you everything but I can't so I'm giving you what I can and I apologize about the long videos see you on my next video